that. All right, what's this one asking us? Several people are standing in a row and need to be divided into two teams. The first person goes into team one, the second goes into team two, the third goes into team one again, the fourth into team two, and so on. You are given an array of positive integers, the weights of the people. Return an array of two integers, where the first element is the total weight of team one, and the second element is the total weight of team two after the division is complete. Okay, so, uh, so let's try to picture this, I guess. I mean, we're given this array. It's got a bunch of numbers. These represent weights. We're trying to divide up these, uh, these numbers into two teams. And uh, the idea is basically that, um, you know, it's kind of like in school when, when you're doing, doing a sports or something like that and you want to pick teams. So we've got team one and then team two. Okay, so basically the idea is that we're just going to go through the array. We're going to say, all right, we'll start with 50. 50 is going to team one. And then 60, that's going to team two. Another 60 is going to team one. So 50 plus 60 will give us 110, not 50 anymore. We'll put the 45 into this one. So that should give us 105. We'll scratch the 60. And then 70 is going to go to team one, so it's going to become 180. Okay, and then at the end of the problem, we're just being asked to return these two values in the form of an array, and so that's what this is. It's the 180 and the 105. So that's basically it. That's that's all we want to do for this problem. So one tool that, that we could remind ourselves is the modulus tool. The modulus tool will be very, very useful here. Just to remind you of how it works, it gives you the remainder after a division. So for example, if we were to do 8 mod 3, well, 8 divided by 3, 3 goes into 8 two times for a total of 6, so we would have 2 left over. The remainder should be 2 here, so when we run this, we should get a 2. There we go, okay, so 2. And if we were to make it like, let's say, a 7, we should expect a 1 here, right? Remainder 1. And if it actually divides in evenly, we should expect a remainder of 0. Okay, now what this is really useful for is if we do mod 2, and this is a really common sort of thing, this is basically just going to give us a 1 if it's an odd number, or it'll give us a, a 0 if it's an even number. It probably shouldn't take this long to run the code, but maybe there's some other issue happening. Okay, there we go. So we get the 1 in that case, whereas if it was uh, 4, let's say, we should get a 0 in that case. So that's going to help us out because it's going to give us an idea of which one to put these in. So we could have, we could have something like this. We could say let team 1 uh, be assigned the value of I guess just zero to begin with, and we'll say team two is also assigned a value of zero. Okay, so we have two teams to begin with, they're both zero, and then we could do something like for let i be assigned a value of zero, i is less than a dot length, i plus plus. Basically, we just check, we say, well, if i mod two is zero, then that means it's even. So under that circumstance, we'll say team one plus equals a at i. Okay, and otherwise, we'll say team two plus equals a at i. And then at the end of all this, we'll just return an array containing team one and team two. And that's basically what we just did working it out on uh, pencil and paper. So there we go. That could be it. You know, this this could be our final answer. And, uh, and, and well, okay, just to be sure of that, let's try submitting it. And there we go. It passes. Everything's great. Uh, we're 20% of the way through exploring the waters. But l let's not finish this up just so fast. I mean, there's more stuff we could do with this. So first of all, something to notice is that basically we're doing this i mod 2 thing, right? So i mod 2 is basically giving us 0, 
if i is even and one if i is odd. So we could just do something like this. We could say let teams be assigned the value of uh, not an empty array, one that starts with two zeros. So it's basically like team one and team two and at the end I'm just going to return teams. Okay, why do I want to do it this way? Well because it makes it a lot simpler because uh, basically we would say this teams at which index? Well, the index i mod 2. So basically, if i is even, it'll go to index 0. If i is odd, it'll go to index 1. And that's really, that's what we want. That's what we're looking for. So we're going to say teams at i mod 2 uh, plus equals a at i. And will that do it? It's being very suspenseful today. There we go. Okay. It worked. Congratulations. Okay, and then of course I'll pull my signature move here and put that on one line. And now this is looking pretty compact. We start with teams as this array of uh, two zeros, basically just empty teams, empty weights, and then we load it up by going through the array, and then we return teams at the end. So I like this. I think this is a nice algorithm. It's direct. I mean, it, it's not spending any extra time, computation time, no extra memory. I mean, what I like about this is it's not coming up with two separate variables at the beginning and then putting them together at, as an array at the end. It's starting with the array that it's going to return and then just sort of loading it up and then returning it at the end. Okay, so then that's, uh, that's one method we could use, and it's probably a pretty good one, but let's just see what other options that we have. So how else could we attack this? Well, um, we've been talking a lot about array functions, you know, like map, filter, reduce, sort, all those kinds of things. So maybe there's a way we could do this with, uh, with a map. So maybe we'll say something like return, and then we'll have an array that we're going to map, and we'll do something with that. But first, what are we going to put in the array? Well, I'm going to put 0 and 1 this time. And the reason I want to put 0 and 1 is because I want to use those as the remainder that we would get from our uh, i mod 2. So basically the idea is that um, we'll say something like uh, mm, let team be assigned the value of a dot filter. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit different from what we did before, uh, but basically a dot filter, and we'll say uh, we'll take the element itself and the index, and in fact maybe I'll just change that to weight to make it sort of reflect what these numbers represent. So, okay, let's say uh, i mod two equals remainder. There we go. Okay, so basically, what are we doing here? We're saying we're going to run a map on this array, and it contains just a 0 and a 1. So basically, looking at 0, first of all, uh, it's going to use 0 as the remainder. It'll say team is going to be a dot filter. So basically, all the elements from a, that'll give us a remainder of 0 when we try to divide the index of that element by 2. So basically, it should be splitting these up uh, sort of in half sort of thing. And uh, and then basically all, all we have to do from there is say something like uh, return team dot, well okay, let's say return team first of all and we'll see what we get from that. Oh my god, ATD, that's, uh, that's very generous of you. Uh, I don't know, I'm not really sure how I get donations going, but uh, let me know if you have any suggestions. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so returning to this, we've got our teams, and you'll notice basically this this is getting close to what we're looking for. So basically, we've got 50, 60, and 70. These are being put into this first array, and then we've got the 60 and the 45. We're putting those into the second array. The thing is, we're not just looking for the array of each of those weights. We're looking for the total. So Maybe we'll do a little reduce on these things. Reduce, we've been finding, is a nice way to sort of get a total. Now, A has already been taken, so I'm going to use P and Q. 
Uh, we could use, you know, longer variables like first and second or something like that, but eh, I don't know. This this should work. So basically, this is a reduce. It's saying we want to go through this thing. Uh, we want to go through each of these teams and basically just add up all the elements in those. So let's run that and we'll see how that works. Okay, so now we're getting an error. What's going on with this? So first of all, this one worked fine. This one worked fine as well, but then over here it's empty. We're not getting anything. Now what did the console say about this? It's saying reduce of empty array with no initial value. What could that mean? So when we're doing a reduce it has to be reducing some array. If we go over here we notice basically there's only one thing here. There's only one weight. So this 80 would get assigned to team 1 and then nothing would get assigned to team 2. So it's a zero. So basically the idea is when I do this filter and there's just 80, I'm saying, well, I want everything that has an odd index. Well, guess what? There's nothing with an odd index here, so that's not going to give us anything. Basically, when I do my filter uh, on, on the 1, with a remainder of 1, we're not getting anything. The team becomes an empty array in that case. And the problem with that is when we try to do a reduce on an empty array, it's not going to have a P and Q to work with. And so it's not going to know what to do with that and it's going to have an error. And that's kind of, it's a bit of an annoyance actually when we're using reduce. So that means we have to build in some kind of, some kind of check here. We have to say like, well, if team.length is zero, then basically just return zero. Uh, and then else we would return this. Thing is, I don't really need to write in an else because if this ends up being the case, if team.length is zero, then it's not going to get past this return anyway. So it's not like it's going to get down here. So it would be kind of redundant to put in an else. So let's just run that and we'll see what we get. We'll see if it passes all the tests. Okay, great. So that passes all the tests. Uh, if you prefer, you know, these kinds of functional strategies, maybe this is a better method for you. But I just want to make it a little more compact. So we're we're sort of, you know, we're saying under this circumstance, return this. Under the other circumstance, return this. We're returning one way or another. So I want to start it with return and then use a ternary operator here. So team.length is zero. Well, in that case, yeah, return zero. Otherwise, return team.reduce pq p plus q. And, you know, you could argue maybe it would have been faster to just copy paste that but eh, it's good to get the practice right typing these things out okay so is this still working first of all yeah it's still working is it better eh, I'd say so could it be even better than this yeah I would say so I mean basically the idea is that we're saying well if team dot length is zero do this otherwise do this thing is if we just ask it hey team dot length you know, is there a length or is it zero so Keep in mind, this is a really important feature of JavaScript. If we give it a zero for, you know, a conditional, something like this, uh, the zero is going to get typecast to false. So zero means false, any other number means true. It's kind of like for strings. Empty string means false, non-empty string means true. I'm not sure if it works the same for arrays. But anyway, the point is, here we're saying return team.length. Uh, and if team.length do something, otherwise do something else. Now we do need to switch these because basically now it's saying, well, if team.length, if there is there a number, is this something that's not zero? If, if that's true, then give it this. If it's false, that's when we want to give it the zero. So now this is just, you know, slightly more compact. Is it more human readable? Huh, I don't know, but I like it. I think this is nice. I think it's a cool way of doing it. So we'll... Uh, well, let's just submit, make sure it's passing all the hidden tests and all that. Okay, great. So, that's working good. We're getting some nice mileage out of this uh, modulus, this mod 2 thing. But let's say, um, let's say for whatever reason, maybe we hate modulus. Maybe we don't want to use the, the modulus operation. Maybe the that percent symbol makes us anxious or something like that and we just don't want to use it. So what other options do we have? Well maybe we could just get a function that just alternates between returning a 1 and a 0. You know maybe something like that would be uh, would be useful for us because that's essentially what we're doing when we're doing i mod 2 right as as i goes up like 0 1 2 3 4 uh, I mod 2 is basically just going 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So if we can return something, if we can get a function that's going to do that, a function that's going to 
like give us one or zero, or, uh, sorry, zero, then one, then zero, then one, and just alternate, then maybe that's better. So we're going to try to do something like that. Uh, but we're kind of getting into this, we're getting into a, a less familiar area here now, right? Because we're talking about a function that returns different things when you, every time you call it. So I don't think we've seen something like that yet. So let's let's make something like that. So let's say, okay, what we're about to do here is we're about to create something that's called a closure. So a closure is basically a function within a function. This is something they talk about a lot in Eloquent JavaScript. So if you're not familiar, you know, go ahead and take a look at that. It, they have lots of useful examples in there. But let's take a look at a few right here. So it's a function within a function. Specifically, I'm going to be doing a function that's going to return a function. So I'm just going to call this one get function. And uh, and let's just keep it simple for now. So this is a function that returns a function. So let's just say return, well actually hold on a sec. We'll say, we'll make a new function in here and we'll just call it um, f. And it's not going to do much. All it's going to do is, um, let's say console.log and it's going to say, hey, what's up? All right, great. And then this get function thing is going to say just return f. f the function. Notice, uh, and this is really, really important. Notice I'm talking about the function f, but I'm not putting these on here. I'm talking about the function as an object. We can actually like toss around whole functions without actually invoking them. And that's what we're going to do here. So uh, let's say return get function. Okay, so I'm calling get function. Get function is going to return this function f. So when I run this, I'm returning f. So that's not actually going to run f, it's just going to return f. It's just going to say you're getting back a function. Okay, so uh, what's the problem here? New type error. Hmm, okay, syntax error. I'm, I'm actually not familiar with that one. That's, uh, that's a new one. So I'm wondering if it was an issue with... Uh, I'm wondering if it was an issue with this down here. Here, let's let's try this. Um, let's say let uh, test be assigned the value of get function, and let's actually just run that. We're not returning anything, but okay. So maybe that's what it was having the issue with. And then let's actually run it. So let's run test now. Notice the console is empty. We're not doing anything. But now we're going to run test because test is a function. We've done get function. Test is being assigned the value of this function up here. And now when I run test, it says, hey, what's up? And we could run it more than once if we wanted to. You know, we could even pop it in a loop or something like that, run it a whole bunch of times. Basically, every time we run it, it's just going to say, hey, what's up? OK, so let's make this a little more interesting. Okay, and this is going to get into a discussion about scope. So we've talked about scope a little bit already, but basically the way scope works is if we were to define a variable uh, in here, and let's just call it num, and it's assigned the value of zero. Okay, and maybe now what f is going to do is it's just going to return num. There we go. Okay, so the first thing is uh, Okay, what can I not do with this? So first of all, notice num in here is inside a get function. So if I were to try to do something like return num, well right off the bat you notice how num is not blue here, whereas it is blue up here. That's basically the uh, interpreter's way of telling us, well you don't actually have access to this thing. We don't recognize num. And that's what it's saying. It's saying num's not defined. What what are you talking about, man? And then, you know, we've talked about this block scoping stuff before, the difference between let and var. Uh, and usually with var, we were able to access these things, but we still can't because it's inside another function, okay? So the difference between var and let has to do with more like ifs and fors and other kinds of blocks, but functions are naturally going to be defined with their own scope. So basically, whether we put a let or a var or a const, whatever, this variable will not be accessible out here. Except, 
basically what we're doing here is we're saying, well, this function f is going to be returning num. It's going to be returning the value of this variable over here. And then we're returning f, so we're giving back this function. So again, we could say let test be assigned the value of get function, and it's going to execute get function. And then we'll just say uh, return test, because test is now going to be a function that returns num. And num is just, well, it's just zero. It's not that interesting. So we're just returning zero. Again, it's not that interesting. So we can make it more interesting. We could say maybe this is our initial value. And so num is going to take on whatever initial value we have here. So maybe it's five. So when we're calling get function now, get function is going to take this value of five. Okay, so five is getting passed to num here. Num is within the scope of get function, but it takes on this value of five, and it's going to tell this function f to return num. It's going to say uh, return, in this case, five. And what's interesting about this is our function test, basically, it's taking on that five thing, right? It's getting that five, and uh, even though that five is is being assigned the, uh, to the value of num, which is within the scope of get function, and we basically lose that scope as soon as get function is done executing here, we can still access it. We can still get num from this function f, and therefore this function test. So it's kind of weird. It can sort of it's almost like we're build, building a function that has like memories of when it was born sort of thing, you know? Like this is creating this function f or returning it and it still has access to num. Okay, now this probably doesn't seem that interesting, so I want to make it more interesting. Let's call our function add1. Uh, that's, that's not how we spell that. Okay, add1. Alright, and then basically what it's going to do is, well let's just say num++ plus plus, and then it's going to return num. Okay, so then uh, let's see. Let's see what happens when we re return test here. Oh, okay, f is not defined. Right, right, because now it's called add one. There we go. Uh, okay, so now we're getting six. So we started with a five, now we're getting six. Okay, so you might think, well, kind of cool, I guess. Not that interesting. Well, let's see what else it can do. So now let's do some console logs. So we're going to do a console log test. And you know what? Maybe we'll do a couple of those. So let's just console log test a few times. Just see what we're getting and then finally we'll return it at the end. Uh, so now look at this. We're not just getting sixes. We're getting six, then seven, then eight. And then finally on our return we're getting nine. So this is a really interesting function now because test takes on this new function which gives us a different value every time we run it. So that's kind of magical. That's kind of a, a very interesting thing. And of course, we can start it at different values. You know, we could start it at negative 5 if we wanted to, and then it would sort of count up from there. Negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. There we go. Okay, so it's a function that does different things every time we call it. And, you know, we could, like, reorder this. We don't even need to call it add 1. We could just say it's a function, and it happens to be the function that we're returning. Okay, so this is... This is basically what closures are all about. We have a function that basically creates and returns another function, and that function has some memories of its scope from within the larger function here, the one that's generating the inner function. So we could put other stuff up here, you know, it could have other memories of things that, uh, that came from when it was instantiated. Uh, and, and also, you know, like we could have other functions, like we could say test2 is going to be get function uh, with 10, and maybe we'll, we'll say test2, test let's do some test2s, so uh, here, let's, let's copy that, and yeah, we'll do a few of those, and we'll see how that works, so for test1, we're getting negative 4, we're getting negative 3, and then for test two, we're getting 11, 12, 13, and then we're going back to test one, and or just test, and it's giving us negative two. So notice it didn't lose its place. So basically, num, what num was for test for this first test, is different from what num was for test two. So not only does it have a memory of the scope from the function that it came from, get function, but that scope and those variables are going to be unique to the instance of get function that we're calling. So basically test and test2 both have memories from their life in the womb in get function, but they have different memories because they started with different values here. Okay, so that's basically what closures are all about. 
Now, specifically, what we were talking about at the beginning of all this is we wanted a function that would basically alternate between returning 0 and 1, or uh, returning 1 and 0. So maybe we'll do something like this. We'll say begin state. Okay, I guess I could have called it initial, but uh, begin state. And then basically we'll have something uh, which I guess we'll just call state, and it's going to be initially equal to begin state. Makes sense, right? And then from there we're going to stay. We're going to say that state is going to be assigned the value of one minus state, and then at the end return not start return state. Okay, there we go. So now let's see how this works. So we'll say let um, indices indices one be assigned the value of get function with a begin state of zero. And we'll say let indices 2 be assigned the value of get function with initial value of 1. Okay, and then let's do some console logs. So let's just say for um, let i be assigned the value of 0, i is less than 10, let's say, i plus plus. I mean, 10 should be enough, right? We'll do console.log indices 1 and indices 1 is a function so we're going to call that and let's just see what indices 1 is giving us okay it's giving us 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 so that's what we want and it makes sense because basically if we start it with a 0 then it's going to say okay so begin state is 0 state starts as 0 and then every time it runs the function it's going to say state is now 1 minus what it was so 1 minus 0 is 1 and then the next time it'll say 1 minus 1 which is 0 and it's just going to alternate from there. So that's another way we can do this without having to use an imod2. Is this a simpler way of doing it? Definitely not. But it's illustrative and it's getting us into this concept of closures which are very useful. So notice the only difference between indices 1 and indices 2 is the fact that this one starts at 0 whereas the other one started at 1. Okay great. So what what's the point of this? Why? Why? You know why are we doing this? Well, let's find out. Let's see if we if we can maybe uh, make that relevant to what we had down here. So in this case, we are basically saying we're returning a map of zero and one. Right? We're saying zero, one, map, and then the remainder here is either going to be zero or it's going to be one. That's how map works. Right? It takes its its inputs from the elements of the array, and then for each of those, it's going to run this function where it says. Well, let the team be the the value you get when you try to filter uh, a. So our original uh, array of of weights like this right here. We want to do a filter of that. So remember, filter takes in a function which returns a boolean. If the boolean is true, it keeps the value. If the boolean is false it removes the value. Okay, so then basically it's going through this, it's getting the team, but we don't want this imod2 business. We, we don't want to see that anymore. In fact, oh, we can do something pretty cool here. So check it out. Now we can say let filter function be assigned the value of get function with a value of, well, basically remainder. But eh, I don't know if I want to call it remainder anymore. I'm just going to call it x for now because you know we're not doing a modulus anymore, so it might be confusing to call it a remainder. And this is where we were basically using it, so I'm just going to delete that and we'll check it out. I'm just going to say filter function. I mean, filter function is what we're using now. Filter function is a function that's going to return just the one or a zero, and where that filter function begins depends on the value of x because that's what we're giving it as its begin state. So x is going to be either 0 or 1. The first time it goes through this it's going to take a function which is going to start with a 0 as its begin state. The second time it'll start with a 1 as its begin state. So let's see if this works. I'm pretty curious about it. Can this work for us? Looks like it does. Okay so you gotta love that. I mean Let's go ahead and submit this. Let's see if it actually passes all the hidden tests. Okay, and that's pretty not bad. That's pretty not bad. Okay, so the question is, is this really better than something like this down here? Well, um, okay, let, let's, let's look at this as objectively as possible. So down here we're basically saying we're doing a map on these two things so that's essentially like a loop that's just going to fire two times and it's going to just 
filter out half the array and then filter out the other half the next time it executes and then basically they say well if there's stuff in there let's reduce it down to uh, a single number otherwise if there's not stuff in there we'll just return the zero okay so how are we doing the filter here versus how are we doing the filter up here and is one better than the other well over here when we're doing the filter we're basically just using this little disposable function that's just doing a very simple math operation and saying is i mod 2 the same as that remainder value that we started with over there and uh if we compare that to what we have over here with this filter function, well, the filter function is not doing i mod 2. It doesn't have to do that math operation. But every time it runs, it is doing this. It's doing 1 minus state. So is that any better? Um, I don't know. Probably not, actually, because it needs to store these extra functions in memory. So it's probably a worse algorithm overall, but I'm glad we looked at it because it's pretty interesting working with these closures. And I, I've been sort of meaning to introduce them for some time now, and none of the previous tasks really felt that natural. You know, it would have felt like, okay, I get it, but why are you doing that? So who knows, maybe it feels that way here too, but the point is we, we were able to get it done. Now, if we wanted to, okay, I'm, I'm going to archive this, so to speak, and then uh, I, I'm going to do a slightly different one. So I'm actually just going to copy this code and I'm going to see if we can sort of clean it up a little bit or at least make it a little more compact. So right off the bat, Let's try this. So we've got this get function x, and I just realized that I forgot a semicolon, so that's bad form. Notice JavaScript really doesn't care very much about that kind of stuff, but but I do. Okay, so there we go. Uh, team is a dot filter get get function at x. Now one concern I have with this is the way we had it before. We're basically saying, well, filter function is get function at x. So basically, it's defining that new function. It's getting its begin state and it's returning this function that it's going to be using. So filter function is the result of doing get function, and then that result, which is a, a function, it's going to work the same way every time. We're putting that result in for filter. Now my concern here is we're just doing get function and putting in a filter right away. So I'm thinking. One danger to this is what if every time it wants to filter an element, what if it's going to go back and reinstantiate this function? So if this works the same way it did before, then what's what that's telling us about filter is that it just looks at this function one time and then sort of keeps that in memory. Otherwise, if it doesn't work, it's telling us it's reinstantiating this function every time it wants to try to filter something. So let's find out what the answer is. Does it work? Yeah, it does. So that means we basically don't need to worry about this being reinstantiated. Okay, so that's nice. That's that's pretty cool, right? But mm, maybe we can make it better, right? I mean, we've got get function over here, and we're calling get function over here. So this is where things get a little more interesting. So I'm going to say get function, mm, no name. Okay, we're not going to give it a name. And instead, we're just going to invoke it immediately. So this, everything that we had here, this is what get function was, right? I mean, get function was just all of this stuff right here. So I'm going to cut that. I'm going to replace get function with all of that stuff. And now it looks real ugly, so I'm just going to move that. Oh, okay, that's not, that's not that bad. Okay, so there we go. Let's run that. Let's see if that works. Kind of a gamble here, but... Who knows? We'll we'll find out. Look at that. That still works. Isn't that funny? So I think that's kind of an, an amusing thing. Uh, let's see. Could we make it even more compact than the than that? Well, actually, turns out yeah, we could because we can take this and put it in here. We can sort of do both operations at once. And then when we run that it's basically going to reassign state and also return it at the same time. Okay, so this is starting to look a lot more compact and then eh, tell you what, let's turn this into an arrow function. Might as well, right? So we don't have to worry about that return there and uh, and there we go. But we do want to be returning this, I think, right? That's, that's our function. So return that function. Basically return a function that goes from nothing and gives this state thing. Okay, and then we'll run that. Wow, okay, so that's passing. Is this the best algorithm? Well, I think in a lot of ways, 
out of the ones that we've written so far today, I think is actually the worst. And I mean that in basically all three ways. I think it's it's probably worse for uh, memory management, for time complexity, and for human readability. I don't think this is a super great algorithm. So which one was the best? I'm thinking probably this one, you know, we just looped through the array one time and loaded up our uh, our array of teams. Like we basically just we're creating the answer as we go here. Uh, we don't need to worry about doing like okay, just even just looking up at this sort of second one we did. Like in this case, we're going through the array twice with this dot map, right? So we're going through the array the first time. We're filtering out half the elements. We'll go through it again and filter out half the elements again. Then now after we've done that filter, then we're potentially going to do this reduce on each of them. So we're going through the arrays again. So these differ in time complexity by a constant multiple. You know, we could say something like, well, this one could be four times as long as this one. But that's not so much a problem. The, when it becomes a problem is where we say, oh, well, this one is going to be n times the amount of uh, time complexity is this. You know, like if this one is a big O of n, this one's big O of n squared, okay, that's a problem. But if this one's big O of n, this one's big O of, you know, four times n, we would still actually call that big O of n because it's it's not it's not giving us like a, you know, a, a steeper curve, right? Like it, yeah, it's maybe a different slope, but it's still linear. It's not going to be just blasting off like an n squared or something like that. Okay, so for that reason, uh, I'm actually, you know, I'm not too, uh, like, there isn't one that's definitively the best here, is, is what I would say. It's not like this one is just far and away a better algorithm than all the others. It, it's comparable, you know, it's around the same complexity. So I think these are all probably big O of N algorithms. But anyway, the point is, look, you've got some options. Uh, we sort of have an idea of what these closures are all about at this point. So that's good. We'll use those tools in the future. But for now, we'll we'll submit this one officially. And uh, let's see. Okay, so we're going to pop out.